Okay, we are on chapter 15, Banner in the Sky. Chapter 15, The Needle's Eye. They slept two to a tent, Rudy with Franz, Winter with Saxo. It grew cold, bitter cold, and the stones under them were hard and thrusting. But for Rudy, at least, tiredness outweighed discomfort, and he was too soon dropping off towards sleep. The last thing of which he was aware was his uncle's breathing close beside him. And, his war and this warmed him more than either the tent or the blanket. After this, his ordeal during the solitary night beneath the fortress, he felt as safe and snug as if he had been in his own bed at home. Once he awakened, it seemed that someone was calling him, but then he realized that it was winter coughing in the other tent. In a moment, he was asleep again, and the next thing he knew, Franz was shaking him by the shoulder. It was still night. The men had agreed that by dawn, they must actually be on their way so as to make use of every moment of daylight. Fumbling in the darkness, Rudy laced his boots and rolled up his blanket, and when he came from the tent, Franz and Saxo were already preparing breakfast. Tea again. Two biscuits apiece, a bit of cheese. Sitting beside Winter, Rudy noticed that he ate almost nothing and kept putting a hand to his still bandaged head. It is hurting you, my captain, Franz asked. Winter lowered his hand quickly. No, it's nothing, he said. It's only a bump. Perhaps with the altitude, but Winter did not want to talk about it. Rising, he began packing his knapsack, and the others followed suit. It had been decided that they would take everything on with them, tents and blankets, as well as food and climbing gear. For although they hoped to make the summit and back that same day, there was always a possibility of trouble. And it was far better to bear the extra loads than to risk a night without shelter on those savage heights. If the way is clear beyond the shoulder, said Saxo, we can leave the things there and pick them up on the way down. The pack straps creaked as they slung them on. Their boots scuffed against cold stone. As they started off, the first band of gray showed in the sky above the ranges to the east. Then they were climbing again, climbing and climbing. The section of the ridge on which they now found themselves offered straightforward going, and they moved all at one time and at a steady pace. For a while, there was barely enough light for them to grope their way, and they themselves were merely a dark file of shadows. But gradually the sky lightened, the mountain emerged into cold twilight, and they could see their surroundings and one another. Rudy was again last on the rope, with winter directly ahead. Although the Englishman kept pace with the guides, it seemed to the boy, watching him, that his movements were somehow slower and heavier than on the previous day. And when he occasionally turned to look down, his face was drawn and strained. He had had a bad night, that was sure, with his headache and coughing, probably a sleepless night. But at least he had not coughed so far that morning, and whatever his pain or tiredness, he spoke no word of complaint. He will make it, thought Rudy. He must make it. Because of all of us, he most deserves to make it. Watching the lean, bent figure ahead of him, he felt a glow of admiration and of gratitude. For without winter, where would they be now? Down in the valley, all of them? He himself at his dishpans in the Beausite Hotel. It had been winter, and winter alone, who had given him the chance, who had brought them all together, who had planned and organized, pleaded and persuaded, who had led them this far up the citadel by the sheer will and drive of his spirit. And that spirit, Rudy was sure, could not now be denied. He would make the top. They, they would all make it. As they climbed, the sun rose. Its rays thawed the cold stiffness from their bodies, and looking up at the cloudless sky, they knew they were to be blessed with another perfect day. But also, when they raised their eyes, they saw something else, and this was a different story. For the shoulder of the mountain was now close above them, and the more clearly they saw it, the more clearly they realized it was to be, it was to be a truly formidable obstacle. Perhaps a half hour's climb above them, the ridge ended. It was not merely interrupted, as had been the case at the fortress, but ended for good. And beyond it, the mountain soared up in what, from below, seemed an absolutely perpendicular wall. Rudy tried to estimate its height from its base. His height. Rudy tried to estimate its height from its base, where the ridge stopped to where its top, the shoulder proper, loomed like a white-rimmed battlement against the sky. 200 feet, it might be, or 300, foreshortening made it hard to tell. But height alone, steepness alone did not matter. What mattered, that there, that there be a way. Rudy bent his head. He concentrated on the next step and the next. A half hour passed, and in one thing, at least, his judgment had been right. For presently, the men up ahead stopped and waited. Coming up beside them, he stopped too. They had reached the end of the ridge. And now four pairs of eyes searched the mountainside above them. The first thing they saw was encouraging, for it was not quite so steep as it had appeared from farther down. And it was not smooth, but broken up into hundreds of ribs and buttresses, clefts and gullies. So far, so good. But what was good was at the same time bad, or at least utterly perplexing, for the very number of these turned the wall into a formless maze. On the ridge, except for a few short stretches, the route had been clear. There had been only one way to go. Whereas here, there was a whole labyrinth of ways, or rather possible ways, each of which might bring them to the shoulder, but might also, far more likely, be merely a false trial leading nowhere. They peered upward. upward. 
They pointed. Franz favored one route, Saxo another, and another argument would have ensued if Winter had not stopped them. It was useless to argue, he pointed out. It was useless even to theorize. No human eye, looking up from below, could thread the maze of the mountain wall. And besides, its whole upper half was hidden behind great bulges and overhangs, and it was impossible to tell which routes did or did not lead to climbable sections above. There was only one way, trial and error. First, they selected a route to the left above the south face, not because it seemed more promising than any other, but because a broad ledge curving out beneath it gave some measure of protection from the mile-high drop below. They had not climbed 50 feet, however, before they reached a blank, holdless wall and had to return to their starting place. They tried again to the right, and again the holds petered out in between and were stopped by an overhang. Franz pointed out a way, Saxo a second, Winter a third, and they tried them all, but with the same result. It would have saved much time, of course, if they had been able to unrope and recoin recoiniture, I can never say that word right, separately, but the going was far too steep and dangerous for solitary climbing. Even on the rope, the man ahead was in a precarious position, for the others could have done little to hold him up if he slipped and fell. The three men took turns in the lead, and each time they had to back down defeated, their faces were tense from exertion and strain. Now, for the first time, they were all breathing hoarsely, and their fingertips were bloody from clawing at the rock. Even Rudy, who only followed where the others led, began to feel the effects of the struggle in his lungs and legs. For the first time, his pack felt heavy and cumbersome, and its straps bit savagely into his shoulders. They advanced, retreated, advanced, retreated. Back at the bottom, for perhaps the tenth time, Winter was overcome by a sudden coughing fit, his first of the day, and for several minutes sat with his head to his knees while paroxysms racked his body. The others waited, watching him with troubled eyes, and the sun, as if to mock them, shone more brightly than ever, glinting gaily on the steel of their axes and the mica in the rocks. When Winter arose, his face was pinched and gray. Sorry, he murmured. You are all right now, my captain? Yes, all right, let's go. Then they tried again. And this time at last, they were able to keep going. Starting up a narrow chimney, they came out at its top onto a ledge, which, though tiny, was yet wide enough to hold them. Beyond it were other ledges, and these in turn led to a second chimney, a belt of slabs, more ledges, a jutting crag. Not that there was anything easy about their progress. and almost every step, they had to stop and plan the next one, and often they followed a wrong lead and had to backtrack. But at least they did not have to descend all the way. Each time they found another route that went, and slowly they moved higher and higher. They were now all on one rope, Franz first, Saxo second, Winter third, Rudy last. And whereas on the ridge they had often been able to climb simultaneously, it was now always a matter of one at a time. On each new pitch there was first a long wait while Franz explored and tested, while the others perhaps offering advice below. Then Franz began to climb, the rope gliding behind him 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet before it stopped. Another wait while he found a stance and braced himself. At last his voice calling, come on, and the other three following in order, with Franz belaying Saxo, Saxo Winter, Winter Rudy, until that particular stretch was behind them. And then the whole performance began again for the next one. The steepness was unrelenting, the holds tiny and widely spaced. Often the toe of one boot and a finger of one hand were all that held them to the mountainside. And although they kept trying to bear to the left, or at least straight up, the contours of the wall forced them steadily to the right. I am going to move into the bathroom because the dogs are barking a lot here. Um, let me move over here. Here, there was no ledge beneath them as on the other side, but only the east face of the mountain plunging plunging sheer to the glaciers, and Rudy, accustomed though he was to height, tried not to look down at the blue emptiness beneath his feet. For almost an hour now, they had been out on the face of the rock, clinging like insects. I think, I think that will work. Um, okay. Clinging like insects. He wished they would come to another cleft or chimney that would give at least the illusion of holding them in. Then they did. Clambering up onto a narrow shelf, he saw to the left a long chimney slanting upward. And though steep, it was cut deeply into the rock and with protecting sides that made it almost like a funnel. The men ahead, however, had not taken it, but were still moving to, up the face to the right. Thinking it had escaped their notice, Rudy called and pointed, but when Winter, who was next above him, turned, it was only to shake his head. Why? the boy wondered. But he was not to wonder long. A few minutes later, the stillness was broken by a rumbling overhead. The rumbling rose to a roar, roar and looking back, he saw a cascade of loose rocks pouring wildly, wildly down the chimney. At least he'd been right in one thing, he thought grimly. It was indeed a funnel. On they went, over bulges, crags, buttresses. Often the rock above them actually overhung, but each time they were able to find a way up and around. The top of one of the overhangs proved to be a fairly wide shelf, and for the first time since leaving the ridge, they were able to sit down and rest. When they rose to go on again, Franz and Saxo changed places 
on the rope. Rudy had never before seen his uncle give up the lead, the lead without reluctance. It was not long before Saxo was put to the test, for a few minutes later they reached a second shelf and stood peering up at a vertical wall. There was no way to work around it, that was obvious. Its surface was smooth and holdless. But up its center ran a long crack, a few inches wide, that seemed to lead to another place high above, if, that is, if it was climbable. Ja, ja said the man from Broly, it will go. And while the others watched, he started up. There were no holds in the crack any more than in the outer wall, nor was it anywhere wide enough to hold a man's body. Saxo climbed by jamming a knee into it, then an elbow, then a knee again, again an elbow, levering himself up, not by any grip on the stone, but by a stone's grip on himself. It was an exhausting process, and every few moments he had to rest, and those below could hear his hoarse breathing as he held himself on by the wedge of his flesh and bone. But always he moved up again, knee, elbow, knee, elbow, until he disappeared. Until he disappeared um, over the top of the wall, and a shout came down to them that he had reached the platform above. Well done, said Winter, and even Franz's face showed admiration, for it had been a magnificent ex exhibition of strength and skill. Then they too went up, first Franz, then Winter, and with the rope from up above them, from up above to hold them, they made it without difficulty. But when it came to Rudy's turn, he was in trouble from the start, for his knees and elbows, smaller than the men's, did not wedge properly into the crack. And try as he would, he could get neither friction nor leverage. He slipped and caught himself, slipped again and dangled. He was not afraid of falling. He knew the rope would hold him. But even worse, I'm having trouble with this thing here, guys, sorry. But even worse was his frustration and shame, for this was the first time in the whole climb that he needed help from the others. He struggled, strained, twisted, clawed the rock, but it was no use. The crack would not hold him. Slipping and dangling, he was hauled up the wall like a despised bundle of firewood until at last he stood breathless and humiliated beside the three men on top. All right, son, asked Winter. Yes, all right, he answered, his eyes averted. But once they were moving again, there was little time to brood over what was past. For now they were really high on the shoulder. The climbing was more exposed than ever, and every step required the utmost concentration. More and more, though they still fought against it, they were being forced out to the extreme right of the wall. Below them were only chasms of space, and above, very near now, the farther, farthest most tip of the shoulder projected in a sharp, almost needle-like point against the sky. Here was where another, here was where they would come out, or that there was no longer any doubt. At that farthest point, at the needle, poised like a pointing finger above the precipice of the east face. Above it, sweeping to the left, was the broad, snow-covered flat of the shoulder. Once there, they would be both e on easier ground and within striking distance of the summit. It was only mid-morning, and with luck, yes, with luck, would they have it? Would they be able to find a way around or over or under the needle in the sky? Staring up at, their, staring up at it, their faces were drawn and grim, for they knew that here was the second key to the citadel. Five minutes, ten minutes, another ten, and there they were. There at the extreme upper corner of the monstrous wall on a tiny platform in a sea of space with the top of the wall curving out in a cornice above them and the needle thrusting up diagonally to the right. Their eyes moved slowly, almost inch by inch over the rock around them. To the left was a sheer cliff, unclimbable. Overhead the cornice, equally so. That left the needle. And they capitalized needle here. So I guess that's actually like the name of a point on this mountain. As they had experienced as they had expected the needle. In spite of the thinness, they knew it to be solid. Otherwise, it would never have weathered the winds and storm of the centuries. Its rock was sound. It would hold them. But the question was, could they hold on to it? There seemed to be two possible ways of climbing, one up and around on the outside, almost to its very tip. The other through a sort of cleft farther in where the base of the needle joined the main mass of the shoulder. Neither offered much in the way of holds or stances, but the second was far less exposed than the first. And after a short discussion, Saxo, who was still in the lead, moved up to try it. For the first 10 feet or so, he climbed directly above them, and then the cleft deepened and bent, and he disappeared. By advance agreement, the others did not follow, but stayed where they were so as to be in a better position to belay the rope if anything went wrong. For several minutes, however, nothing did. The rope glided up, stopped, glided again, stopped again. Finally, it stopped and stayed motionless for a long time. What is it? Winter called. There was no answer. Doesn't it go? Still no answer. But after a few minutes, the rope began to move slowly downward. Then Saxo reappeared, maneuvering carefully down the cleft, and soon he was beside them again on the platform. It does not go, he said. Why? Where does it lead to? Beyond the turn, it cuts deeper into the mountain. There are holds. It is not difficult, but it gets darker and, darker and narrower like a tunnel, and at last so narrow that a man cannot pass. Even when I took off my pack, I could not get through. It is not good. It, does no, it is no good. It does not go. How far up does the tunnel go, asked Winter. He could not tell. 
Could you see light above you? No. Perhaps if you had gone a little farther, Franz put in. If you think you can do better, Saxo told him, go ahead. Franz did. Climbing up the clef cleft, he disappeared for a full ten minutes, but in the end, like Saxo, he returned defeated. No, it's too narrow. One cannot get through. There was a silence. No one moved. Then slowly they turned their eyes turned to the other route, to the point of the needle, to the tiny cracks and wrinkles it formed its only holds, slanting up to its tip above the terrible abyss. It's my turn now, said Winter quietly. No, my captain. Yes, mine. Winter laid down his axe and unslung his pack. Changing positions with Sack so that he was now first on the rope, he moved out toward the edge of the platform. He and the two guides wrapped the rope around their bodies and braced themselves as best they could. But it was an almost useless belay. For once out on the needle, Winter would be both above them and off to one side. And if he fell, he would drop so far before the rope caught him that it would either crush his ribs or more likely break. The guides knew it. Winter knew it. Rudy knew it. And he knew, too, that was why the Englishman was going first. Not because he considered himself the best climber, but because the risk was so great and he was resolved that it would be his. Winter stood poised on the rim of, the, of nothingness. He rubbed his hand slowly against his trousers and then he swung up and about. His first hold was a tiny crevice into which he managed to insert two fingers of his right hand. The second, a shallow notch which held just the toe of his right foot. For several moments, he clung to these while his eyes searched the rock ahead. Then slowly, so slowly that it scarcely seemed motion, seemed motion at all his left hand moved to where his right had been and the right to another hold farther on at the same moment his feet shifted and they too were farther on and higher again there was a weight again the groping creeping movement he was farther on in the needle then still farther and it was a miracle of climbing of nerve and balance to those watching from the platform the holds were no longer visible and it seemed that winter was held to the rock by the mere touch of toe and fingertip Sometimes his body was arched out, straining against the sky, sometimes flattened in as if he were trying to press it into solid stone. Once, for what seemed an eternity, he hung spread, eagled, and motionless, seemingly unable to shift either a hand or foot. But at last there was again the slow groping, the creeping, the grasping, and he moved higher and higher. His line of ascent was diagonally up the side of the needle, and if he were able to continue, it would bring him out at a point just to the left of the tip. From here on, if the main mass of the mountain, the snow-covered, from here on, from here on in to the main mass of the mountain, the snow covered upper face of the needle was almost level against the sky. Indeed, as far as he could be seen from below, it was simply an extension of the broad shoulder. And once it was reached, there would be no further difficulty. But the question still remained, could winter reach it? That is not quite the end of chapter 15, but I am going to stop right now and do a second half because it's a long chapter.